it's an honor to be here. I'm going to briefly talk about some work I've done with Doug Medin, as well as my colleague in the Nobe village where I do work, Salino Garcia. I'd like to take these few minutes to talk about a cognitive tool that we use constantly and effortlessly, but which literally animates our world. <coughs> Imagine you see this versus this. The two situations seem very distinct. The first is sheer physics, but the second invites a qualitatively distinct construal. There seems to be intentionality at work here. That is, the hand belongs to an agent dropping a rock. So agency will be our central concept. It can be defined as the capacity to interact with the world in non-random ways. And here the term non-random entails specific action patterns based on research with infants and adults. These action patterns serve as cues to alert us to the fact that the entity we're observing <coughs> is not a passive object, but rather an agent. And this is a very basic conceptual distinction that we draw all the time. But we don't go around the world, of course, talking about non-random interactions or even talking about agents. Instead, the conceptual language we use for this is folk psychology or explaining agency in terms of minds and mental states. So if we see an instance of goal-directed motion in the world, we will say the entity wants. Or likewise, if we witness contingent interaction, we will say it's communicating. Folk psychology is robust. We use it all the time when explaining agents, but rarely when explaining gravitational forces, which we attribute to folk physics. And yet, there are certain things that exhibit the essential markers of agency but which seem to fall outside the terms of folk psychology. For example, plants. Now, in the West, mostly persons would be reluctant to say that a plant wants or communicates, although, of course, it exhibits goal-directed motion and contingent interaction. Instead, these cues would be interpreted or reinterpreted as something like automatic survival instincts or the emission of chemicals. So this has led to the proposal that plants and other non-animal agents belong to a separate domain of folk biology. So we end up with this tripartite split of domains for parsing agency. And as these citations, just a sampling of citations show, a lot of research supports this picture. But most of it has come with Western populations and or industrialized populations. And it's hard not to notice that this particular partitioning of domains encodes a Western worldview, where intentionality is exclusive to humans and other animals, that is, it's anthropocentric, whereas other natural kinds can be explained in non-intentional reductive terms. This raises several questions. Is this the only way to parse the domain of agency? Is there an alternative to folk psychology? We've been asking these questions for several years with the indigenous Nobe community of Panama, and their answer seems to be yes. So we're going to take a closer look at plants because they exhibit key markers of agency that fall outside Western folk psychology, but which may be included in an alternative conceptual framework for agency. In fact, our studies with Nobe and US college students show that Nobe are more likely than US students to attribute a range of agentive capacities to plants. Here's just one sampling. Most Nobe will agree that plants can feel, want, experience pain, and think. This holds across a variety of methods and languages, and we've um, demonstrated this now across several studies. But crucially, Nobe attribute these capacities on the basis of non-mentalistic criteria. So instead of appealing to minds and mental states when they're justifying their agency attributions, their explanations focus on the capacity to relate and interact. So for example, one Nobe informant would say that plants feel because they feel they have life to wither. They want water and minerals. 
Or another Nobe informant said that plants think and justified this by stating, plants have the thought to grow. So clearly, Nobe take the evidence, which is available to all of us, that plants grow, they eat, they wither in response to their environments, but they use these very interactions as evidence to infer agency. Whereas in the West, we would look for something underlying those internal processes, such as consciousness, before attributing agency. So if nobody used communicative criteria as the basis for inferring agency, then it's easy to see how this affords recognition of multiple non-human agents. We wondered if this framework could also guide inferences about instances of reasoning about plant behavior in the real world. So instead of just ways of talking about agency, also guiding inferences about predictions in, in the domain of plant botany. We tested this using several action prediction tasks where the scenarios were modeled on recent botanical science, demonstrating kin altruism as well as plant communication. And in fact, we found that Nove are more likely than US college students to predict that plants will engage in these complex social behaviors, thus aligning with recent botanical science. And in an ongoing study, we're also testing action predictions regarding plant um, perception of and response to sound which is something Megan pointed out earlier today. So based on these and similar studies, we argue that in the Nobe perspective, various classes of natural agents are held in closer correspondence under what appears to be a unified domain of agency, a folk theory we refer to as folk communication. This invites a few conclusions. The first is that there may be multiple conceptual frameworks for reasoning about the domain of agency. Or it, there could be multiple languages for talking about the basic cognitive distinction we draw between agents and objects. It follows then that folk psychology may reflect a cultural epistemology rather than a cognitive prior. And folk psychology may end up emphasizing those aspects of agency that are most relevant to Western sensibilities in particular, focus on humans and their minds. This, this emphasis may not be shared everywhere in the world. So there is a long history of folk psychological research in the West, and lots of studies have shown that it's a useful way of framing questions and getting data, and even getting data that supports your questions. Um, but a lot of the conversation today has talked about the problem when you find cultural differences. Reviewers may argue that those differences are an artifact I wonder if sometimes universals are an artifact of our methods and our questions being very um, simplified and maybe reinforcing our assumptions all down the road. But at the very least, I think that the work we've done so far invites curiosity about whether culture influences not only folk theories of the people we study, but also our own academic theories. And I think that learning from the Nobe suggests that it's critical to pay more attention to the way in which our own cultural intuitions inform our theories and to explore the alternatives available on other cultural frameworks. And with that, I would like to thank the Nobe with whom I've worked, um, my advisors, and everyone else who made this work possible. Thank you. Thank you.